Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast, where we share stories and strategies from the game's most fascinating minds. No matter where you are in your poker journey, there's always something new to learn. So let's get right into today's conversation with your host, Robbie Straczynski. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. I missed you guys. Have you missed me? I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski, and we have a great guest on today's episode. That is Zach Elwood. Over the years, Zach's name has become synonymous with everything having to do with tells. His website is readingpokertells.com, and he's an expert when it comes to visual tells, verbal tells. The man even knows when you're dreaming about tells. Zach, welcome to the show. Hey, Robbie. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having it's, me on. So, it's so good to hear your voice. I've seen your, your, your name everywhere for so many years. Oh, same with you. And then, uh, yeah, I've heard your heard your voice, obviously, with your with your other work. But uh, yeah, nice to finally talk to you. Likewise. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm this is going to be such an enjoyable conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. So, so let's just dive right into it. You know, I did mention um, when someone thinks of tells, you know, your name is pretty much immediately one of the first ones to come up. So let's briefly. You know, maybe if you can encapsulate how did you first get into poker in the first place and then maybe go a little bit deeper into how you got interested in the physical behaviors at the tables and tells specifically. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the psychology of it was actually one of the first things that interests me in poker. I I used to play poker you like in even middle school and high school times at my friend's house. And I was always really interested in it, playing with his family and his family's friends. And then in college, I, uh, I set up games and stuff and, Mm -hmm. you know, took, took money from my friends in college and (laughs) took, took notes on my friends, uh, various mannerisms, like their, you know, their tells. And, uh, so that was, that was kind of the background. And then later when I started playing for a living, like in 2000, three to 2007 time period uh once i started playing higher like at a, at a casino and playing online um mm-hmm. yeah the, the psychology was just what got me into it and then when i so i played for a living back then mm-hmm. and i was always thinking you know that was kind of like going through the poker the start of the poker boom mm-hmm. and uh i was always thinking you know i didn't think the books the books on tells that were out there were that good uh mm-hmm. you know you had you had caros of course which is a classic and mm-hmm. uh I, I respected that but i thought that there was a lot more to say and i was always expecting you know like one of these well-known players uh that i you know that you see on tv will will uh write a great book on poker tales but then over the years it never happened and so eventually in 2010 i had the idea like oh i'm, I'm gonna write the book because i feel like not that I think I'm a genius, but more like I, I've noticed a lot of things over the years that haven't hmm. been put in, put into writing. And so that was what led to me writing my first book, Reading Poker hmm. Tells. Were you like a teacher or, or a psychology major in college? Do oh, you have any sort of background no. like that? Nothing like that. Just an armchair psychologist. You know, I used to read, even as a kid, my dad had all these uh, psychology books in the house because he was, he just liked to read a lot of books. And uh, I I used to read like Freud and other, you know, books about, uh, you know, uh, Freud had a great book about the the, the path of, uh, pathology of everyday life, I think it was mm-hmm. called, and just examining everyday spots for meaning. And so I, I always had a long interest in that. So I was just an armchair psychologist, read a lot of books on my own. And um, hmm. yeah, so that kind of informed my interest and in thinking about it over the years as I played. You know, I was always taking notes on people I played with. And so that was the background. It wasn't like I'd, it, and I, and I definitely, you know, there's lots of people that that play a lot too that experienced players that I think, you know, have these kind of thoughts, uh, knowledge about the game too. But I just mm-hmm. think it, it was not everybody writes them down. Right. And, and right. focuses writing about it. So, you know, and talking to people over the years too, I realized there was a lot to say that hadn't been put into print. And that was, hmm. that was what informed, you know, leading to the, to the first book. Interesting. Well, I mean, did you sort of say to yourself, you said you used to play professionally. Was this sort of like an idea of, hey, you know, I could go ahead and transition out of playing professionally and make this into a profession or it's just like, let's see where this leads? Oh, no, I was never, you know, when I wrote the first book, I mean, I I only played professionally like full time. That was like my only source of income for like three and a half years or so. And, uh-huh. uh, and since then, I've played, you know, just semi-professionally on the side. So it was never a sense. It was never a case of. Uh, you know, 
I want to transition as like a big deal. And in fact, when I, I mean, when I wrote the first book, I wasn't sure how it would be received. I was ready to just, you know, have it be ignored uh, and, mm. you know, carry on with other things. But the fact that everybody responded to it and, and really liked it led me to working on the other stuff. You know, I wrote, I wrote the other right. two books and worked on the video series. So I was incentivized when people, when people responded to it and really liked it. And sure. uh, yeah, but you know, when I when I wrote it, I, I, w- I wasn't thinking it would make much of a splash. I was just, you know, here's here's some thoughts I have, and you know, I think people responded to the the the, the situational thinking, you know, as opposed to like a list of tells. I think mm-hmm. they just really like the the categorization uh, and basically like the framework for thinking about them, and I think that's what people responded to. And you're saying that this was, you know, well, I guess what 2011, 12 that that time. Yeah, Wallace? the first book came out. In, uh, first book came out in like early 2012. So I'd been thinking about it and writing it for like a year and a half before that. Yeah. Wow. So <clears throat> you were looking at like you said you mentioned Caro's book and stuff. You sort of looked at what was out there and said you want to do something differently, and, and you focused a lot more on the the structure. Uh, that's what you're saying when when you wrote yeah it? I think uh, yeah I mean Caro's book. I mean I, I think Caro's a classic, and I think it's a must read for everybody. And, and I think uh, that was the only book I really respected out there. There were a few other books like Navarro's book, and I I, I didn't I didn't think much of that book, and I didn't mm-hmm. think much of a couple other ones that had come out. I just uh, I just thought they were written by people that didn't play much poker. And so, yeah, it, it was just a motivation. Like, I think there's more to say. And I think, you know, Caro's, Caro's book, it's great, but I also think it focuses on a very uh, beginner level opponent, you know, kind of psychology mm-hmm. and tells. And I think he also, you know, had a lot of five card uh, draw stuff in there because that was sure. the main game he was playing. So it was kind of like trying to update that and, and think about things in a more, uh, in, in a way that also applied to a lot of more experienced players. But, and it makes sense. Like when, when Caro wrote his book, it was what, the, the 80s, I think? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Yeah, or late seventies or early eighties. Yeah, right. I think so. so the game of that time, the game of poker, was different in a sense than the game of poker when you were writing your book. So it makes sense that hey, you know, there ought to be something new in, in speaking to the modern poker world. Uh, so yeah, it, it makes sense. Gr- great niche. Right. To he, and he, uh, and he, yeah, and in Caro's game, you know, they were playing in these California card rooms where the main game was was five card draw and uh-huh. uh, getting, a, you know, they were facing a lot more like, you know, it was it was California big city kind of area, so they were facing sure. a lot more recreational kind of player pool and, and a lot of a lot of the tells he talks about are just kind of like very first level um, tells that you won't see beyond like a very low limit or very you know beginner level mindset. I think right, uh, yeah. Interesting. So, and, and you mentioned uh, Navarro. For, for those uh, of our listeners who don't know, you know, it's the reference to Joe Navarro. He's a, a former FBI agent. Uh, you know, an expert on uh, behaviors, uh, I believe. And um, yeah. I, I just kind of wonder, you know, when you think about um, tells, you know, those at least to me, you know, if you had to ask you know, like a Family Feud answer, who are like the top three? And, and I'm thinking Joe Navarro, Mike Caro, Zach Elwood. You know, right there, have the three of you ever sort of like met and done like a little a tells summit, maybe where you sort of discuss <laughs> your field of expertise, bounce ideas off each other, some. I mean, it would it would be fun. We've never done that, but uh, I mean, <laughs> not, I, I and I, I have respect for Caro. I think he's kind of out of you know the scene pretty much. Sure. I think he's not sure what he's it's in doing. The somewhere. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. He's like Walter White hiding out in a right. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have respect for him. I've never talked to him. I, I've even I've tried to interact with him before, actually. Uh, but uh, Navarro, yeah, I think I don't think Navarro does much on tells anymore. I think he, I think he basically, I mean, he he does say like literally, quite literally, like he he's ba- he barely played any poker when he wrote those books, and actually, like the books were kind of a, a way to take his. You know, it was kind of like a team thing with him and Phil Helmuth and uh, mm-hmm. Marvin Carlins, who basically ghost wrote the book. And it was kind of a way to take his general interrogation and interview behavior, general behavioral knowledge over to mm-hmm. poker and basically, you know, kind of market it to the poker audience. But in my mm-hmm. opinion, you know, in my in my opinion, the, a lot of that more general uh, behavioral and psychology, uh, those concepts don't map over well to poker. I just think there's 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 key gaps where things that uh, makes sense in general psychology, like interrogating someone just doesn't apply to poker, you know, and I actually wrote an article about that, like the things that I think like general behavioral people get wrong when they try to apply general concepts to poker, because mm-hmm. poker is such a different environment, you know, it's like, there's built in, uh, there's built in deception, because you, you, you under, you automatically assume that your opponent is trying to deceive you. And so you don't trust the things that they do. And so it creates this very unique environment like that doesn't apply to interrogation kind of situations where, you know, um, it, it's just a, it's just a completely different um, 
kind of landscape, emotional landscape. Sure. And, and you're not even necessarily knocking Joe's work or career. He's just, you know, you both of you are sort of coming from different standpoints, you know, him being a career agent in the FBI where that's precisely what he had to do. Whereas you were a, you know, a, a professional poker player for a couple of years, you come from the poker world. <coughs> so it makes sense. You have different vantage points. Right. It's, yeah, exactly. And I'm not knocking him because I think, you know, people obviously respect his general behavioral work, which mm-hmm. I think applies to a lot of situations, real life situations, non non competitive landscape kind of situations. I think I think the I think the mistake, which I think is very common, was in thinking that that just maps over very easily to poker. You know, like for example, the big the big thing is, you know, in Joe's book, the big problem I had, which was in this article I wrote, it was a. Uh, you know, this kind of assumption that these self-soothing kind of behaviors that and somebody being interrogated would would uh, have like, you know, rubbing your neck or rubbing your mm-hmm. face to suit self, you know, like that's something that people under stress do. But you'll mm-hmm. find in, in poker that doesn't map over well because right. a, a, buffer, a buffer is just not going to do those things. It's so rare to see a bluffer like do self-soothing kind of uh, behaviors because it's understood. It's, it's instinctually understood that those are the behaviors of somebody who's nervous. Precisely. And, uh, and and you don't have that kind of you don't have that fear in an interrogation of giving away self soothing behaviors that you do in poker. Like a bluffer just instinctually is like, I don't want to give off anything that might be interpreted as anxiety. You don't have right. that in you don't have that in an interrogation room because right, you're not somebody, you're not protecting a back room where illegal gambling is going on somewhere or something like that. And you're not you know in an interrogation you're you're not scared of t- of giving off anxiety to your interrogator because you know it's under you know it's 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 understandable that even an innocent person would be anxious in such a situation so you're not as you're not as instinctually being aware of like oh i'm so afraid of giving off that i'm anxious or scared you know like it's just it's just you know and plus you have to you know there's more of a you there's more of a pressure to actually interact and talk in an interrogation whereas in poker you can just sit there and be still you don't have you aren't forced to uh interact you know so it's just a different it's just a much different landscape and i think that's you know that that was my big problem with navarro was you know, and a lot of other people, like you can find just general behavioral people mm-hmm. trying to apply these general concepts to poker. And I think a lot of times they, they screw up for that reason. Certainly. Well, I mean, it makes sense as a, an expert in this kind of a field that you wouldn't just write books and, and produce the other types of study materials. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But you also take on uh, or have taken on uh, private clients. And a couple of those clients were World Series of Poker main event November Niners. So how did they discover you or did you know sort of reach out to them? Here's my business card. Or what, what was that business uh, experience like for you? Yeah, that was some interesting stuff, which, you know, kind of has fallen a bit by the wayside now that they do the, you know, the main event continually. I mean, there's right. still, a, still a chance to do that, but it just hasn't come up since they've switched. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, how that started out was with Amir Lahavit. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, From Israel, uh, like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. So in 2000... Uh, 13, I think it was, he reached out to me because he had read my book and he had made the final table. Hmm. So it was just a couple of weeks before, actually, before the, uh, maybe maybe a month before the final table in November that he reached out to me and uh, he was doing, you know, simulation uh, mm-hmm. final tables in Vegas with some, with some other, uh, you know, including a few uh, well-known players. They were, they mm-hmm. were, practicing and he he said uh yeah how about analyzing some of the existing footage and then during the final table how about you know looking for for stuff that might be interesting wow um uh, and uh analyzing you know his opponents and also himself too looking looking and watching him um so that was exciting and you know and then i did for in 2015 a couple of years later i i worked for uh, max steinberg sure uh, mm-hmm. who made the yeah made that final table and you know these guys these are smart guys and none of right. us had none of us had a uh you know an idea that like you know, there was a good chance of spotting something because, uh, you know, as you know, like the November nine, like with that much time to prepare, people are very, you know, aware of their, they've had a lot of time to think about being super stoic and, and, right. and working on the So it's not like we thought like, oh, we're definitely, you know, there's a good chance of us finding something. It's more like if there is something there, it's, it'd be worth time spending, uh, worth spending the time to, to look for it as kind of like checking, checking that box to be like, I've spent some time thinking about this part of it, you know? Hmm. Interesting. Um, I, I, I have to wonder then. So here he is, you know, reaching out to you for help. And, you know, it's quite possible exactly as you said that, you know, these guys may find their own uh, weaknesses and cover them up and learn how. Do you feel and under some sort of a pressure during those four months or did you feel rather uh, to say, you know, to come up with some sort of a, of a list 
uh, for them of like, okay, this is what you got to improve, or here's a syllabus, you guys got to study this type of thing too, or just, you know, it was a mutual understanding, I may or may not find something here. Yeah, I think it was more understood, like, it was, you know, it, it's unlikely we'll find something, because first of all, the, the amount of footage you can find on people before the final table is pretty slim, you know, you don't have mm. a, a large sample size, so that's one mm -hmm. factor. Second factor is they're going to be well prepared. Most of them, and a lot of them, were experienced or professional players already. So you know, it's more like it's more like uh, watching the available footage, coming up with ideas for what could be possible, and then looking during the final table to see if those things you've thought about or other things are showing up. But obviously, it's you know, it's it, all, above all, it's a small sample size. And let's you know, for some of the players, there were some good other events to draw from, like where they mm -hmm. had been in other events fairly recently. So right. that was nice to have, you know, focus on them. Uh, above all, you know, I think the main things were focusing on the players who you thought were weakest, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at least experienced, at least uh, that, that could be least experienced overall or just least experienced live, uh, focusing on them. And then, you know, just coming up with uh, uh, for each player a list of what things to look for when the final table was, was going on. Sure. Well, I guess the, 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 the natural follow-up to that is after they completed their runs, you know, neither of them ended up winning, but they both did pretty darn well. Did they, you know, come back to you and, and say, hey, you know, it actually worked. I noticed such and such, and that really did help. Or did that just not happen? It sort of petered out. No, it did, didn't happen, uh, and that, okay. that was ex that was expected. But they both, you know, I have I have reviews from both of them on my site. I mean, I, oh, we good. all we all felt like it was it was valuable. It wasn't like we thought it was going to be likely that we would notice something. I mean, it, it could have like they both admitted though the things we talked about, you know, and and theoretically, you know, that stuff could could have played out to be helpful. Sure. Um, yeah. And so, in their future and, poker games, I'm sure they, they they definitely came away with some lessons as well. Yeah, that, that's that's possible. Uh, I would I would also say I, I don't think I made it clear. Like so, during the final table, I was sending them because they each had their own uh, Skype group, you know, and friends on the oh, side. Oh, so it was simultaneous, like while yeah, I was while the thoughts. stream was going. Yeah, exactly. So I was sending thoughts from watching. You know, I was watching twenty minutes ahead. Um, you know, that's pretty ahead. cool. But it was, so it was, but it was fairly, you know, fairly simultaneous. Sure. Wow, unbelievable! Like after the but fact, it wasn't, you know, you know, these years later, some some interesting factoids come out. Yeah, and I think as far as I know, I'm the only person who who's done that kind of work. I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. other people have done something, but they haven't made it public or something. But right. uh, yeah, so uh -huh. it, and it wasn't like I, I didn't want to overburden them with thoughts either. So it had to be Naturally. reach a certain level of uh, of like me thinking it was worth saying to even mention it to them because you get a lot of thoughts as you're watching, but you're like, I want to only I want to filter it down to like the stuff that is not going to just fill their mind with nonsense. I mean, because they have a lot of other stuff. Obviously, the tells should be very far down the list of stuff they would act on. But sure, it was more was, like there was no like emergency phone call, dude. There's a throbbing neck vein. Nothing like that, right? <laughs> Yeah, nothing like that. It was more like, I mean, which, which is, you know, I think that kind of stuff is possible. Like I've written, I don't know if you ever saw that that piece and video I made about uh, P.S. Hines, you know, in the 2011 uh, oh, main event. Uh, final I, table. I, I think he had quite a, he had quite a significant tell, which, you know, that's the kind of thing that you'd be hoping to find. Like he basically had uh -huh. this eye contact thing where he, uh -huh. when he looked at it, when he looked down from his opponent, when he was the aggressor, when he was looking more down at the table, he was more likely to be strong. And it was a very very valuable piece of information for him because and, and he was he was very inexperienced live like they said like that was one of his few he was quite experienced online but that was sure. one of his first uh live events i think they said and that was that was why i studied him very carefully because i was like oh there's probably going to be something for him uh right. so that was interesting and that's the kind of thing you'd be hoping to find you know is like there's some kind of cool thing but it, you could also find things that are like you know, slightly valuable. It's like, if you think, for example, like I, how it could theoretically come into play for the, for the main event stuff, work that I did for those guys, it could be like, well, I've noticed this guy, you know, is, seems slightly more likely to, you know, uh, bet more quickly when he, you know, uh, on the Turner river when he's weak. And so mm -hmm. like, if it wouldn't necessarily be like that valuable, but if like Amir or Max were like slightly on the fence about what to do, you know, they could, that could inform a decision. You know, it could just be like uh, something when they're on the fence to, to help inform a decision. Understood. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that, that is uh, some really fascinating stuff. And, and when we come back, we're going to talk some more to Zach Elwood, poker's resident expert on all things tells related and learn more about some of his other projects and experiences. But first, a little strategy break. Sometimes players come to me after losing a chunk of their bankroll. 
And of course, we'll run some analysis to try and figure out what went wrong. Very often, it'll be possible to pinpoint a key moment during the session where that player could have dramatically cut down his losses by quitting the session. We're not talking about avoiding variance here. We're talking about a key moment in the session where the player's judgment became obviously compromised due to mindset issues. The problem is, when we're stuck, we don't always want to quit. We want to keep playing, win our money back. And actually, a lot of players have the opposite problem also. They spin up at the beginning of the session. They're actually up quite a few buy-ins. And they want to quit for the day. They feel this overwhelming pressure to stop playing and book the win. The big problem here is that we usually end up putting in the most volume when we're stuck and our mindset is bad, and the least volume when our mindset is winning. So what's a solution for this issue? Why not try the following challenge? We set a timer for our session. One hour, two hours, whatever it is, once the time is up, we quit the tables. Regardless of whether we are up or whether we are stuck, we quit. In some senses, the harder it is to quit, the better. The more we build discipline, the more we build on the idea that we are our own precise masters of the amount of volume that we play. If we feel like quitting early, we grind through. One way or another, we ensure we play exactly until our time is done. No matter how strong the feeling of quitting early and protecting our session profits, we play until the timer is up, even if it means we lose everything back and more. The best players understand the importance of discipline. This is how we train it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. Robbie Straczynski here with a really fun and intriguing guest to to be speaking with. It's Zach Elwood, author of Reading Poker Tells. How's it going so far for you, Zach? Oh, great. Yeah, great questions. Good. Awesome. Now, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so, okay, let's, let's go, you know, beyond the first book that, you know, you've also produced a bunch of other excellent tells related materials, which of them would you say that you're most proud of? I'd have to say that's verbal poker tells my second book from mm-hmm. 2014. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you, have you seen that one? Have you heard uh, of that I've one? heard of it, of course, but I'm sure some of our listeners don't necessarily know, uh, you know, the, the, the contents of which, so, you know, why don't you go ahead and tell us about it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so that one was that was a follow up to my first book. You know, after I was incentivized by people really liking reading poker tells, mm-hmm. I was th- I was thinking like, well, if I'm going to write another, if I'm going to write something else, it has to be something really unique and something I think is is fairly unexplored. So sure. I hit on the, I hit on the solution of um, talking about verbal poker tells and th- things people say during a hand. You know, so mm-hmm. uh, so for eight months straight, basically full time, I worked on that book and. That's wow. the one I'm most That's a proud long of. Time. I know. Yeah, I didn't really expect to work on it that long, honestly. Like, I, you know, I was I, I, I was planning on spending like a few months on it because I, honestly, like going into it, I kind of thought I knew a lot of what I was going to say. But the more I dug into it, the more I felt like I was learning a lot as I went. So I just kept going and was like, well, I, I'm going to I'm going to try to do this as best as I can, however long it takes. So, yeah, no, no joke. I worked like 50 hour weeks for eight months straight. And I watched, I, so I, I kept this database of, uh, I watched a lot of televised poker and I was, I kept this database of logging different kinds of behaviors. So I had this spreadsheet of like different codes, I mean, different kinds of behaviors. And I was constantly mm-hmm. adding, adding to that as I kind of noticed more kind of patterns. And so, uh, watched a lot of televised poker. I played, a, I played a good amount at like five, 10, two, five, one, two levels just to, mm-hmm you know, log what people were saying. And I even tried to engage people in conversation just to see what they would say and did that more than I usually would. And so Mm. I I built this pretty long uh, database of like thousands of hands that I went through or watched. And, um, and, and so after that, that allowed me to put together this, you know, this, these various patterns and how they showed up and, Really, I learned a lot in the process, and that's why I'm so proud of that book. Is because you know it, it, some of the the main conclusions I I drew were not what I would have thought when I set out on that path. Hmm. Both for this as well as for your first book, you know, having done all of the the legwork and you know putting all of that time and effort into it, you've come up with tons of theory, and obviously people are are going ahead and and purchasing these items and learning from it and hopefully growing from it. How about yourself? You know, you still do play poker. You know, have you been able to put your theories and, and your knowledge uh, into practice and become a more profitable player from it? 
Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I learned a lot from writing my books, you know, I, and I think that's one of the things about them is like, I can say like just me thinking more about this stuff has made me more aware of things in a better, a better player, a stronger player. So mm-hmm. I can I can vouch personally for it because yeah I I see the value yeah and I, honestly I'm kind of I'm pretty burnt out on poker just from thinking about it so much and <laughs> you know all the, the these books like I've said like my last my third poker book exploiting poker tales is my last one because I don't mm-hmm. see that ever happening again I'm just I'm just a little bit too burnt out plus I think right. I've, <laughs> said, I've said I've said enough I've said enough on the subject so uh, uh-huh. but yeah I I definitely see the see the value there yeah w- would you say that. At, you know, as one moves up in levels, there's less and less to see, or is this just, you know, just like you said, it's verbal and behavioral patterns that people have no matter what stakes they play? Well, I think it, I mean, I think it comes down to the experience level. I mean, you can have, and also the seriousness, you can have people who are, have played their whole lives, but if they don't take it very seriously, you know, that's, they're still going to have some, some patterns. So mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's, you know, it's a combination of experience and, and how serious they take it. You know, and that's why you can find, you know, you can quite, you can find quite obvious tells and obviously fundamental mistakes from, you know, at very high stakes game in very high stakes games, because, you know, it's just a combination of either not playing much or just not caring whether they're good or bad, you know? So I think that's, you know, obviously you see a lot more comp- frequent, uh, obvious things at lower stakes games, but I think, I think you see, you know, even, even good players, I mean, can be even, even very good players can be imbalanced. It might not be a, a very obvious imbalance, you know, like, but mm-hmm. it, they can be imbalanced. And even if you think that's only like slightly reliable, it can help out when you're on the fence, you know? Uh, sure. So if you think, you know, if you if you think a very good player is, is more likely to like be talking a bit when they're weak pre-flop, when they raise, you know, pre-flop, it might put, if you're on the fence of three betting them or not, you might just des- decide to three bet them, even knowing that that's maybe only like a 60% reliable thing, you know, sure. uh, as opposed to like, you know, far from a hundred percent reliable, you can sure. still, you can still use those kind of, uh, basic general ideas or player specific ideas, even if they're far from, far from, uh, entirely, you know, hundred percent accurate. Sure. And, and you know, much of your research has been, you know, from, from your own play at, you know, I guess it's what, two, five, five, ten. That's uh, sort of the general uh, stakes you're playing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I never, I, I was never a super high stakes player and sure. never, never, never uh, pretended to be. And that was, yeah, that, that was my kind of my peak of, um, of no limit play over the years was, was five, ten. I never really wanted to play higher, honestly. And I, I I just I I've never been cut out honestly for for high stakes play. I've always been sure. kind of an anxious guy, and uh, <laughs> so I, I always was fairly uncomfortable with the poker table to begin with. So yeah, that's my. Okay. That's my story. Well, I, I get that. Nothing to to apologize for. Anything. Everyone's got their own uh, comfort levels. But you have watched plenty of uh, video material and live streams, as you said, and even you know in person, you've seen people playing. I kind of wonder, just you know, as a poker fan, so many of us, uh, and I'm sure a bunch of the you know, the red chip listeners here, um, we watch these you know super duper high stakes, you know, hundred thousand dollar, three hundred thousand dollar buy ins. You know, and the guys who, you know, they're the math whizzes. They're studying all the GTO and all that stuff. When you watch that, you know, when you've ever seen it maybe on Poker Go, do you even notice things in them or are they really just genuinely robots breathing rarefied air? Well, I think there, yeah, there can be some stuff there. I mean, I think a lot of those guys, the guys that we recognize as being very good are very, are very stoic and don't have much, you know, there's not much there, but I do think, you know, occasionally you, you see some stuff and for specific players, you can find Ooh. some stuff. Uh, wow. and I think, I think how it happens also is one thing to recognize is like, just, you know, sometimes you'll see a player, let's say like Negranu do something that seems really obvious from a behavioral aspect, but at the same time you have to factor in, they're doing that because they're focusing that behavior on a specific player themselves. Right. So just because, just because it might seem imbalanced from the outside, they, they, they know what they're doing. Probably, you know, if, if, if they're experienced, like Negron, you knows to a, to an experienced player, he might be doing something that is imbalanced, but he's purposely using that because he thinks it'll have an effect on the player he's playing against. So sure. I think you have to, you have to take that stuff into account too, that just because we, we might notice imbalances, from experienced players, they might, you know, they might know what they're doing, but uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I see, I see plenty of, um, my database is full of things that I think are, are not purposeful, uh, tells from experienced players, but like things that they're giving away without knowing it, wow. you know, whether, whether that's verbal or not. But I think in a lot of cases, their opponents are just not attuned to that kind of thing and are sure. not paying attention to themselves because like, for ex- one example, like comes to mind is chance, uh, what's his name? Chance. Or- 
Chance Quinn, Quinn, yeah. Like there was one spot where he had a what I think is a very reliable tell mm-hmm. of strength, and I put this I put this hand in the expo- in exploiting, exploiting poker tells, mm-hmm. and he was uh, he was versus Fedor Holtz, mm-hmm. and uh, you know I, I just don't think uh, I, I think I think. Um, it would be very unlikely for the in this one hand for a chance to have been weak just because of this verbal tell he had, uh-huh. and uh, and and Holtz ended up uh, calling him with basically a bluff catcher, I think. Wow! And, uh, it, it was just you know the, so I see I, I mean I see spots like this pretty frequently where it's like I think if if the per, if their opponents had known a bit more about tells they never would have made that specific decision just because to me it's like screamingly obvious that this person's very you know very likely to be stronger weak one way or the other. It's so, so funny yeah. as you describe this. I imagine myself, you know, when when I was younger, I used to sit and watch Jeopardy, and so many of us out there can relate to that experience. Of course, that's the answer. Come on, guys, <laughs> the contestants right. it's are always, on the tables. So. It's always easier when you're watching, you know, from a distance too, because right. it's, you know, you know <laughs> I, I'm not, you know, I I don't want to sound like I'm like it's a, it's also obvious because I mean, obviously, when you're at the table, there's you, you got you got many other factors to consider, and like I say in explaining poker tales, when I wrote about that hand, I'm like, for all I know they had some history that I don't know about where the exact same thing happened and they were leveling each other, you know? So there's a lots of unknowns. And so I don't, I don't, I don't want to pretend I know all the factors, but <laughs> I, I do think, uh, I, I do think it happens, you know, frequently enough where, you know, I, I think, I think even for online players or, or like very, you know, GTO and, and, and fundamental strategy focused players. I think even if you only were to, think about the tells that are super obvious i think there's there's benefit there because even if you don't want to act on that information that's like more more ambiguous or wishy-washy behavioral information even if you even if you don't want to act on that more questionable stuff there's plenty of spots where it's like it's it's so correlated with you know a specific hand strength in general and you know just overall uh that i think even if you just focused on those really powerful ones you'd be you'd be helping your bottom line a lot because i, right. I just see a lot of those spots where it's like you know some tells are, are more ambiguous than others some tells are, are quite powerful uh overall and if you just focus on those really powerful ones you'd, you'd be really helping your bottom line yeah well, it, make, it makes perfect sense so so over your years of research and you've obviously um you know expert you've you know you've written books and you've re- you've produced so much interesting material on tells I'm wondering what are some of the most interesting tells that you've noticed in poker players and and maybe behavioral or or verbal patterns that you've uncovered and found Yeah I I'd bring it back to the the verbal poker tells work like one one thing that really struck me when doing the research for that that it kind of it seem it might seem kind of obvious in hindsight, but it's it shows up so powerfully. So it's this concept that uh, bluffers, players making significant bluffs, are very unlikely to make what I call weak hand statements. In other words, they're mm-hmm. they're unlikely to make statements that weaken their hand range. So and that's a much more powerful uh, and reliable source of info than is like talking about strong hand statements. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's an example would be and, and so these kind of weak hand things can show up in very indirect or, or subtle ways. Like a really a really obvious one would be like a player making a big bet on the river and saying right. something like, uh, you know, I'm I'm bluffing or something. Like, you know, that's 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 a that's, that's something that you hardly will ever see because, you know, it just makes sense that bluffer I mean, occasionally you'll see it, but mostly you won't see it. And then the reason is because bluffers just don't want to put that idea they don't want to play these complex mind games, you know, they, mm-hmm. they, they don't want to like actually put that idea in their opponent's head. And mm-hmm. so there's all sorts of kind of indirect ways that that uh, shows up more subtle ways. Like for example, uh, an indirect example of a weak hand statement from a bluffer or from a, a better would be somebody goes all on the, on the river and says, Oh, I knew you didn't have much anyway. You know, I knew, I, knew, I knew, knew you didn't have a hand. So by implying that his opponent's hand is weak, he's also uh, he's he's also implying that his own hand is weak too. So that's uh-huh. that's what I would call an indirect weak hand statement. He's basically saying, I I didn't need much to bet. I didn't need much of a hand to bet because I knew you were weak. Right. So and so you, when you start keying into that pattern, there's all sorts of more indirect and subtle ways that this shows up. Uh, that and, and it all fits under this category of weak hand statements uh, from from betters, you know. And so that actually that that uh, example I told you about Chance Cornuth versus mm-hmm. Federer Holtz, that was an example, an indirect example of a um, weak hand statement. And how it happened was, I think Chance bet on the river, I think, and uh, he said something like, "Phew, glad you didn't snap call." 
All right. So <laughs> you, you hear that kind of you, you hear that kind of thing sometimes, right? And, and it's, right. A, it's a it's a statement of relief that a person's bet was not immediately called, mm-hmm. and that's an indirect weak hand statement because what they're saying is I'm not at the top of my range, and I'm glad you didn't snap call me because of now course. I feel better. So you're mm-hmm. weakening your you you know you're weakening your hand range basically. And so a bluffer is just very unlikely to do that. Like in all, in all the examples I have of that kind of pattern, like I, I don't, I think I might have one and it was from a very, uh, very good player versus another very good player where they were trying to level each other. But it's like <laughs> in, in all the other examples, it's, it's like, so it's so clearly, you know, it's like 90, 99% examples of, uh, just somebody expressing actual relief, you know, right. uh, because you know, you just think about it. It's like, why, why would a bluffer ever want to, you know, weaken their hand range in that way? Uh, they, they, they want to keep their full range of hands in their opponent's mind. They, they don't want their opponent thinking, oh, well, they definitely don't have uh, quads here, you know? Uh, so all the, so the verbal poker tells the book, uh, is just kind of full of the, uh, full of those, not all of them, but that's one of the main themes and uh, themes of it, these ways that, uh, uh, these kind of weak hand statements can show up. Gotcha. Wow, it's it's just fascinating to sort of get into your into your mindset and like you watch things so differently than the rest of us. I would say like, like that that last bit that you said, it's kind of like a throwaway statement. You don't really pay much attention to it because the hand is over, and you learn so much and you can extrapolate so much information and then learn for future hands from it. The way you analyze it is is very eye opening. It's very interesting. Yeah, and then that was the hand where uh, Fedor called with like a bluff catcher. And I think that, that was, that was what I was saying where it's like that kind of pattern is just so co- highly correlated much more. And, and these kinds of verbal statements can be so much more reliable than, you know, physical movements because physical movements are, you know, oftentimes so in- ambiguous, you know, the physical behaviors. Uh, and that's why I liked about verbal poker tells because, because once you key into a lot of these statements that are kind of common patterns, uh, you can, you you find that they're super reliable and you feel very good relying on them in some some high spots you know some some big river decisions or whatever for sure well you you know we've spoken about uh your three books that you've produced but you've also produced uh, video as well as audio materials, uh, in including in a massive series of instructional videos and even uh, a podcast uh, more recently. Would you like to tell our listeners a little bit about that stuff? Yeah, so the video series I released in 2015 and. I think when it started, it only had about 13 videos, and then I've been adding to it since then. I think it has about 30 videos now. Uh, so I add, you know, a few, try to add a two to three or four a year. And yeah, there's like nine hours of training content. I think nine hours plus of that. And sure. uh, yeah, that that was uh, that's mainly using real footage from Windy City Poker Championships, which is a organization that sets up both cash games and mm-hmm. tournaments in chicago sure. and so I, that's that's the main source of uh, footage i use there and yeah i just have a lot of actual spots each video talking about a specific behavior and having actual uh, several actual situations of that behavior and analyzing it and i like the video series because it gives you a chance to talk about various factors being present in the same hand you know as opposed to just talking about one factor at a time you're like well these factors are present and these factors are present and how do they balance against each other? You might have, Mm -hmm. you know, several tells reliable tells that show up at the same time. So it kind of gets you thinking about multiple things being present and also just fundamental strategy, which I don't pretend to be an expert on, but I'll try to weigh in, weigh in on when I think it's more of obvious thing to talk about. Understood. Uh, Understood. Yeah. So that's at reading poker tells dot video. And then I have, uh, yeah, the podcast, which I just started a few months ago was, it's not really new. I didn't realize I I thought it'd been going on for a while. Oh no, it was just a pretty recent thing. I just, I kind of spur of the moment decided to do it a few months ago because I had an interview with, uh, I talked to Brian Rast and he, we had a really good conversation about tells and, uh, I wasn't even planning on doing anything with the audio because I just wanted to do an interview to use for like written stuff. And then I re- was like, mm. wow, this is, this is really interesting. Like I, 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 wish I had recorded it with better audio cause I was like typing over it and stuff. So I, it gave me the idea to make a podcast, and it's so it's not poker related. It's just general uh, psychology and behavior related. I interview various people about how human behavior plays a role in their jobs and then in their industry, and so it's kind of like a profession, you know, a cross profession kind of look at how people are using behaviors and or behavior and psychology in their hmm. in their work. So I interviewed, like for example, like interrogation experts, uh, statement analysis guy who was in. Uh, U.S. Marshal trainer and wrote a book wow. on some statement, you know, verbal and written statement analysis and talked to a jury selection uh, expert who does uh, jury selection and voir dire, um, 
you know, consulting. So just, uh, yeah, it's just a wide range. And I do want to do, I, I sometimes tie it into poker. Uh, if the conversation is about a subject that I think has a poker relation and kind of a maps over, I'll, I'll bring up poker a bit, mm-hmm. but yeah, mostly it's just, it's just general psychology and behavior. Got it. Well, I mean, you mentioned at some point, kind of like a, a little bit in passing that, you know, at this point, after doing it for so many years, you're just, you know, a little bit burnt out on all the poker stuff. I'm, I'm kind of wondering, so what are you up to these days? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I am a bit burnt out. I still work on the, uh, I do want to add stuff to the video series because I have this backlog of various unproduced uh, scripts that I have that will, you know, bring up some of the content from my books and over into the video series. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm still working on that and also doing the podcast. But then I'm also doing some software, uh, doing some work for software companies, some writing related work, basically. Ah. And yeah, so I'm doing that too. Okay. And you're still playing though. I don't play much. I played oh, the really? other day. Yeah, I, I, I really, honestly, in all honesty, like I don't enjoy it much anymore. And oh, shame. Uh, I, I mean, it's 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 kind of related to you know, I, I never I never really wanted to be a professional poker player. It was kind of just something I kind of fell into, you know, like wow. a decade ago. And it, it was never my goal to like be a high stakes player or anything like that. So right. it, it kind of just, I mean, I'm interested in the psychology element, obviously, but it was never my goal to be like you know playing high stakes games in Vegas or anything like that. So. Sure. That combined with me writing a lot about it and, you know, playing a lot over the years has kind of led to me being a bit burnt out with it. I mean, I still love the game, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but I definitely find that uh, when I play it occasionally, I enjoy it a lot more than when I play it a lot. Yeah, so, and actually, I played, yeah, I played the other day, but it was the first time I'd played in, in a year. Wow. And I guess, you know, I, you have to sort of play it recreationally at this point and not be taking notes and saying, okay, I got to gather material from another book or something. Uh, yeah. And, and also, you know, there becomes like kind of a, uh, you know, you, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty anxious guy and kind of neurotic. So like when I, when I play and people know that I wrote these books, it kind of like makes me more anxious than it used to. (laughs) You feel, you feel more under the microscope, you know, and like, uh, you know, people are expecting more from you and then you just, you know, it becomes less fun because people expect more from you, I think. Oh, I'll just tell you a little tip then. Next time you go and play, tell them your name is Robbie Straczynski, and they're just gonna they're gonna go ahead and raise and re raise oh, yeah. you know, without will, any sort of you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they and they know that I'm just gonna go ahead and fold. So just play yeah. that to your advantage next time. <laughs> I'll, I'll remember that. I'll, I'll put on the disguise. Yeah, I'll go to I'll go to Vegas. You'll start hearing like Robbie Straczynski is, is <laughs> playing in a lot of games. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 weird to play as like you know. It, as that guy is it? yeah they're like oh i bluffed out the tells expert i'm like yeah that that happens i'm not gonna i don't i don't <laughs> pretend to be able to read everybody in every hand Come on. fascinating i love yeah. it i love it well zach i've really really enjoyed speaking with you and you know a very interesting guest and, and and i imagine that some of our audience members might have additional questions for you or or maybe they want to go ahead and purchase your product so why don't you go ahead and say again where can they find it and how they can get in touch with you yeah, so I've got two sites, which was maybe a bad idea, but I've got readingpokertells.com and I've got readingpokertells.video for the video stuff. And mm-hmm. I've also got a YouTube channel you can check out. It's at Reading Poker Tales on YouTube, and mm-hmm. that's got a lot of free videos. And a lot of people have said that stuff alone is is really valuable, just free free content. And yeah, my books are at readingpokertells.com, or you can find them on Amazon or Audible too. There's audiobooks. Uh, yeah, and the podcast you can check out on uh, you know all the podcast platforms, iTunes. It's people who read people. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, and to get in touch with you on uh, Twitter or something, or you got an email? Address? Oh yeah, Twitter is a poker player, and you can if you want to get in t- contact with me. Probably the best way is just going to readingpokertales dot com slash contact the contact page. Uh, that's probably the, the best way. Awesome. Zach, thank you again very much for joining me here on the Red Chip Poker Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski, and thank you all once again so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode. But don't stop learning now. Head over to redshippoker.com. You'll find everything you need to get better today. Join our free, friendly strategy group and start talking poker with our coaches and community. And listen, if you're ready to take poker more seriously, sign up for CORE, our $5 a week complete training platform built for players who have limited time to study. CORE is packed with over 100 bite-sized lessons from the fundamentals to advanced strategies, quizzes, achievements, discussion threads, and more. And for the bravest of heart, we invite you to check out our pro membership, which includes 24-7 access to hundreds of videos, all of our playlists, all of our crash courses, and more. 
If you want to see what the top 1% of players are studying to keep their edges razor sharp, visit redshippoker.com slash ruby. That's R-U-B-Y. And get a special deal on your first three weeks. Until next time, run good, play better, and get there.